Okay. We have a long jumper. Here's the ground. We know the long jumper takes off at an angle theta, which is 30 degrees to the horizontal. We don't know the speed. We know he flies through the air and hits the ground. And the ground distance travelled is 9 metres. What we want to know is the velocity and both magnitude and direction at the end. The direction is pretty easy. This is a symmetrical parabola. Um, it goes up and comes down at the same speed in the absence of wind resistance. So that angle is going to be theta and the speed is going to be v. We know what theta is. We don't know what v is. So that's the tricky thing. We can't really use energy here because energy never tells us details like precisely how something goes from one place to another or precisely how long it takes. So this looks like it's a case of actually working out the forces. In this case, the only force that applies as someone's flying through the air is a downward force of gravity, an acceleration of g downwards. So what this means is the horizontal component of the velocity vh will remain constant and the vertical component vv will decrease at g meters per second squ squared so go down by 9.8 meters per second every second what are the components we've got trigonometry theta v v and vh so this is the opposite, the hypotenuse, the adjacent. So we know that cos theta is adjacent over hypotenuse, is Vh over V, which means that Vh equals V cos theta. Similarly for sine, which is opposite over hypotenuse, so V vertical equals V sine theta. We can check we did the trigonometry correctly by asking if theta was zero, um, what would happen? If theta was zero, v and vh would be the same thing because you'd be firing it horizontally. And indeed, if cos theta, if theta is zero, cos theta is one, so v is vh, sine theta, or the theta is zero, is zero, so v vertical is zero. So all looks plausible. Now you may well remember some equations for projectile motion like this, but I have a pretty bad memory and I don't remember them. I work it out from first principles. We know the sideways velocity, so if we so therefore we can work out how long it has been. Um, sideways velocity vh. It travelled a distance of nine meters. So the time is going to be the length divided by the velocity. That's an L, not a V. That's just the definition of velocity. Um, the, the velocity is the re rearranged velocity equals distance over time. So if we knew the horizontal velocity, we could work out the time. If we knew the time, we can work out the horizontal velocity. Unfortunately, we don't know either of these things. But we can work out the time because it starts off with an upward velocity and then comes down with the same downward velocity. And we know the vertical acceleration, so we can ask how long does it take to turn VV into minus VV? So the change in velocity, vertical velocity, is 2v vertical, and that must equal the acceleration, which is g times the time. So 
So this is what we know. We know that the acceleration times time must have been enough to cancel out the vertical velocity and give it an equal and opposite downward velocity. We know the time must have been enough to get the object sideways to the target. And we know from trigonometry the vertical and horizontal components in terms of v. v is what we need to know, if you remember the question. Here's the question again. With what velocity did it hit the ground, which is the same as the velocity it took off at, which is v. So how do we solve for that? We would need to get rid of t. We don't care what the t is. Um, so the obvious way to get rid of that is to substitute this into that. So that gives us 2 v v equals g l over v h. Now we can substitute in our trigonometric equations, put v h down there and v v in here. So we have 2 v sine theta equals g l over v cos theta. We arrange to make v the subject, so put that v up here and put the sine theta down there and the 2. So we end up with v squared equals g l over 2 sine theta cos theta. An answer. How plausible is this? Well, we can check one way by making sure it behaves in the right way. If g was bigger, more gravity, you're on Jupiter, say, then the velocity must be bigger. They're proportional. Makes sense. If l was bigger, that means if you went further, well, then you must have gone faster. So that also makes sense. If sine theta, if theta was zero, that means you're going horizontally, and sine theta is zero, zero that would mean you've got something over zero, infinity. Fair enough. Um, if you're traveling horizontally, you need an infinite speed to go any distance before you hit the ground. If theta was 90 degrees, going straight up, cos theta will be zero. Once again, you're at one over zero, infinity. And so once again, um, if you're going straight up, you're not going to get sideways no matter how fast you go. So that all makes sense. We can also check the units. Um, both sides of an equation must have the same units, otherwise it wouldn't be valid if you changed units. This is called the method of dimensions check. So v is squared is meters per second squared. Now g here is meters over second squared. L is meters, and sine and cos are just ratios, so they have no units. So we have a meter squared, meter squared, second squared, second squared, tick, dimensions check. And functional form check. Let's put some numbers in. So we've got 9.8 g times the distance, 9. Um, no unit conversions needed over 2 times sine theta, sine 30. Yeah, 30 sine, which of course you know is a half, and cos the 30, 0.866. So we have 9.8 times 9 divided by 0.866. Six 
apples. Hundred and one meters per second, which looks silly. So what's gone wrong here? Well, that's v squared. That's not meters per second squared. So v will be the square root of that. 101 meters per second, does you 300 kilometers an hour. People don't run that fast. So that means that um, v equals the square root of that, which is 10 meters per second. Rather large, I think. Um, I mean, that means at 10 meters per second, you'll run the 100 meters in 10 seconds. If any of you happen to know the world record time, it's a little bit less than that. This means this person, when they took off, were actually running at pretty close to world record sprint time, speed. So that does seem a bit high, um, but maybe it's fair. After all, the world record sprinters have to start off a bit slower, and it does say this is a pretty good athlete, so maybe it's plausible, but it is worrying. Worryingly large. But other than that, everything checks out. In this case, I'd probably suspect the uh, um, something in the calculation. Um, it's not something in the calculation that the numbers were given wrong. Jumping nine meters is obviously a very, very good athlete. So a little worrying. I wouldn't necessarily trust this very much, but that's how you do the calculation.